Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me on this week's episode of The Skin Reel. This week, I am really excited to be talking about this class of drugs that has just exploded in the last 10 to 15 years. And joining me is my colleague, Dr. Chovatia. And he is an assistant professor of dermatology at Northwestern University School of Medicine in Chicago. He received his medical degree and PhD in immunology from Yale, followed by his residency and research fellowship at Northwestern. Dr. Chovatia is now the medical director for the clinical trials unit and leads the Center for Eczema and Itch at the Department of Dermatology in Northwestern. And he has a particular interest in optimizing patient-centered care, understanding chronic disease burden, especially in these understudied inflammatory diseases that we see in dermatology, and improving care across a diverse range of skin types. He is asked to speak as a speaker and researcher and leader all across the country and internationally. So I am thrilled that I was able to snag him for about 30 minutes out of his busy schedule to talk to us here on the podcast. If you have a history of uh, inflammatory skin disease or really any sort of autoimmune inflammatory disease, you are going to want to listen in to learn all about JAK inhibitors. Dr. Chobatia, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for the very kind and unnecessary introduction. All right. Well, let's start off with the very basics. What are JAK inhibitors? Sure. So when we say JAK inhibitor, we're referring to a family of medications that all share certain functional similarities. By virtue of the way that they work, there's a reason why they're used so broadly in inflammatory disease. So just to make it super high level, and we won't get too much into the weeds here, you can imagine the immune system is a series of signals, almost like a relay race, right? One cell produces one signal, another cell recognizes it, that produces a signal, another cell recognizes. But what gets lost is how does a cell actually recognize a little protein that's floating around outside telling it what to do? And this is where the JAK stat pathway comes in. JAK literally stands for Janus kinase. So it's a family of intracellular kinases that's named for Janus, the Roman god of duality. And the reason why that name exists is that these JAK proteins occur in pairs. So there's four of them that the human body has, JAK1, 2, 3, and TIC2, named kind of completely differently. But they work together on the inside part of the cell to translate a signal from the outside into something that affects transcription and translation on the inside. And they actually are used across a whole host of different types of receptors that are relevant in different types of diseases. So it's one way in which a lot of different signals of the immune system can use a lot of the same machinery. And another one of those cool examples we have of how nature comes up with really nice evolutionarily efficient ways for us to use the same machinery over and over again. So JAK inhibitors quite literally are small molecules that inhibit those enzymes on the inside of the cell that are important for immune signaling. So then if you inhibit that, you are thereby preventing the downstream effect, which would be potentially inflammation or whatever skin condition or rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's exactly right. So I mean, without even needing to understand the basic science behind it, the idea that you could potentially be hitting a very conserved and important group of proteins in order to stop a lot of diverse and different signals is very attractive when you're thinking about all these autoimmune and chronic inflammatory diseases where there's a lot of dysregulated immune activity that you don't want to have, but rather you want to try to get things back to a normal set point. Yeah. And, and certainly in dermatology, we see so many of these inflammatory skin conditions. And most people are probably familiar with psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, but there are hundreds of these, maybe even thousands, right? Yeah. I mean, so the big ones would be something like atopic dermatitis or colloquially what patients oftentimes call eczema is the most common of the inflammatory skin diseases. Believe it or not, probably about 10% of people in the entire country have some version of atopic dermatitis ranging all the way from very, very mild to severe. 
psoriasis is another one that we've seen a lot of excitement for in years just because there's a lot of new medications. You can't turn the TV on without seeing a commercial for a psoriasis medication these days. But there's other diseases too that fit into this family. Vitiligo is one of them that has autoimmune mechanisms and has inflammatory mechanisms as well. Alopecia areata or an autoimmune form of hair loss is another one in this family. Hydratinitis suppurativa, a really sort of complex uh, disorder that results in scarring and boils and drainage in different aspects of the skin. Also another inflammatory disease as well. And this even goes beyond dermatology. You mentioned rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. These are diseases that rheumatologists see, but also function through very similar ways. And so do these JAK inhibitors work on all of those diseases you just mentioned? Yeah. So, you know, at the earliest points, JAK inhibitors really enter the discussion for potential therapy for joint disease as opposed to skin disease. The earliest phases of development were for rheumatoid arthritis. So one of the earliest drugs that we have is something called tofacitinib, which is a more broadly acting medication, but that was originally approved for rheumatoid arthritis a long time ago. Another one of the sort of the older medications in this class is ruxolitinib, an oral medication. That one is not also approved for anything dermatologically, but it's used for several different conditions in the hematology and oncology space, myelodysplastic syndrome, and certain types of blood conditions as well. It sounds like you can use these medications in a variety of ways, topically as creams and then systemically by taking a pill. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So one of the nice convenient things about a small molecule as opposed to a larger, bulkier antibody protein, the kinds of medications that we see commercials for as injectables, small molecule inhibitors of JAK proteins uh, are very nice, stable, they can come in a cream formulation, they come in an oral pill, and that allows really broad applicability. So in terms of some of the JAK inhibitors that are out there right now, there's a topical formulation of ruxolitinib that comes in a cream that in the last couple of years has been approved for atopic dermatitis. It's also been approved for vitiligo as well. In terms of oral JAK inhibitors, we think about in dermatology, we have upadacitinib and abracitinib. These are medications that are used for atopic dermatitis. And in the case of upadacitinib, some other rheumatologic and GI diseases as well. Baricitinib is another one that was more recently approved. This is a drug for alopecia areata, the hair loss disorder I talked about. It's also approved for rheumatoid arthritis as well. And then we have a few others in investigation for hydratinitis supportiva, alopecia areata, and vitiligo that have yet to come out. One of the newest ones probably that really made its way uh, to us in the armamentarium is a medication called Ducravacitinib. This is an inhibitor of TIC2, which is one of those four proteins in the JAK family that just doesn't have the JAK name. And this is an oral option for psoriasis that's also being investigated in other disease states. Wow. It's amazing to think about all these options we have. When I was in training, I felt like we had topical steroids and very limited. And it's really just changed, I'm sure, patients' lives to have these treatment options. Are these drugs safe? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I'll take it back to your training for a second. And the reason why you probably hesitated is because you would hate to say that you had to use medications like cyclosporin, <laughs> methotrexate, Tacrolimus, basically the big guns of dermatology and most other conditions where we worry about infections in patients, lab monitoring, kidney issues, liver issues, blood pressure, you name it. And so while we've had to use these medications for decades, and there's some reasonable data there, they've never been a preferred option, which is one reason why there's so many patients out there that are just in need of good therapy. So the great thing about JAK inhibitors is that they're targeted unlike many of these other less targeted therapies that more broadly suppress the immune system. So that already tells you one thing about safety, that with some degree of targeting, you're going to instantly eliminate a lot of the extraneous effects that you really don't want to see in your patients. Another important point about the JAK inhibitors is that, you know, they're not all the same. And why would I say that? Well, there is a class-wide box warning that exists on all JAK inhibitors, whether you're topical, whether you're oral, whether you're indicated for rheumatology, dermatology. And a lot of this comes from some of the early studies with tofacitinib, a drug that I mentioned that was used to treat patients with rheumatoid arthritis. To make a long story short, patients were studied over a decade, and they tried to really understand if there were specific risks that some of these patients had. So amongst these 
older, sicker rheumatoid arthritis patients that are a little different than our patients in dermatology, those that actually were on this medication along with steroids and methotrexate, basically a lot of big bone medications, did seem to have increased rates of infection, potentially blood clots, potentially heart conditions. And so because of that, the FDA mandated that every single JAK inhibitor has the same exact warning placed on its label whether or not it has anything to do with that medication or that disease space. So one of the biggest, if not issues, let's say points of discussion since the approval of a lot of these meds have been, what does this mean for the dermatology patient? Are these safe? Are these not safe? Who's the right patient? And what our data is telling us probably is there's a lot of differences between somebody with eczema, psoriasis, alopecia, and vitiligo versus somebody with rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis. By and large, most of these really worrisome side effects, despite being listed on every package, have not really appreciably happened to any degree. And we're starting to build up long-term data, one year, two years, three years, and beyond that's telling us that they're quite safe. And I can speak for my clinical practice as well as those are not events that I've witnessed in my patients. So some of the most common things that you think about, perhaps somebody might have an extra cold every once in a while. Some of these drugs are associated with kind of mild acne and folliculitis, which as a dermatologist, you can very easily treat. And so that's not a big deal. Some nausea, headache, the kind of common stuff you'd expect with any medication. So by no means do I mean to dismiss safety as a concern, but I always like to put this in the context of my patients that really the biggest risk we run for, you know, treatment of your disease is not treating your disease. So what can we do to actually put you on the right therapy that's going to give you the best chance of not only rapid clearance and long-term clearance, but safer than a lot of these options we've had to use for a century? Yeah, that's such a great point. Not treating can have of a whole slew of, of problems as well. But I know when patients see that black box warning, they're going to worry. So you definitely have to mention that ahead of time and allay their fears that this is not the case and it actually is really safe and safer than doing nothing and safer than a lot of the drugs we had 10, 15 plus years ago for sure, which is great. And I also, it probably matters whether you do topical versus oral too. You're going to see some different, um, you know, you probably aren't going to see the GI upset or nausea with a topical cream versus the oral potentially. A great point. And yeah, so for the the one topically available medication that we have, which is topical ruxolitinib, um, you know, this was a point of, of concern too, that should we be worried about absorption and systemic effects, not systemic effects. And it looks like based on what we saw in the trials plus the real world, it's pretty rapidly acting medication that seems to be high on the efficacy end and really not much as far as the safety end goes. And it's really nice for us to really get more real world experience with these medications because they're so new. Not everybody has tried them. There's only so many years of data we have. And you know, as well as I know, that clinical trials in many ways are ideal scenarios and they don't represent sometimes the heterogeneity that exists in the real world. And so I think that as more time goes on, whether topical, whether oral, we're all going to start to get much more comfortable in figuring out who's the right patient for what therapy. That kind of brings me to my next question. When you are seeing someone for these inflammatory conditions, when do you jump to a JAK inhibitor? Is it kind of your first line or do you try other things? How do you walk us through how you how you determine that? Yeah. So typically with most of the oral JAK inhibitors, they're usually uh, in the indication statement says something along the lines of a patient who has not optimally responded to conventional topical therapy or just can't get topical therapy for whatever reason. Most people in dermatology have had a topical steroid or two or five or 10 at some point. So that's not a really hard bar to cross. I mean, like you and I both know the classic patient bringing in their little bag and dumping it all out, everything they've used. And so like usually you can cross that threshold. For some of the oral agents, particularly the ones that are approved for atopic dermatitis, there is a stipulation of somebody who's had experience with any systemic therapy. Now, that's based less on data and probably a little bit more about just overall abundance of caution from the FDA in terms of being extra safe. But for many patients with really bad, uncontrolled eczema, they've been on oral steroids, they've been on other medications before, so also not really a difficult one. So effectively, in many ways, 
a potential first line therapy that you can use when someone comes to see you for moderate to severe disease. For many of these other disease states, um, in the case of topical treatment for atopic dermatitis, for vitiligo, oral treatment for baricitinib with alopecia areata, I really look at these things as medications I can immediately use in my patients, just given the fact that in some of these disease states, and vitiligo and alopecia are good ones, we don't have any approved therapies. So, you know, my my initial argument would always be if I don't get the approval that I want from insurance, tell me what is the alternative that's approved? Because at the end of the day, like there isn't any. And so it really goes down to do I want to do things the way that I was doing them 10, 20, 30 years ago? Or do I want to make sure I'm doing right by my patients? And it's a nice situation to find yourself in where you get to have that discussion. What's your research on right now that you're working on? Yeah. So, you know, at any given time, there's any number of trials that are being conducted, both in terms of earlier phase and then later phase, where we're just really trying to understand what's going on in terms of head-to-head efficacy between some of these medications and more conventional options so we can better understand how to choose the right patient. A lot of the more clinically oriented research that sort of I do with a, a lot of my team and, 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 and fellows and other researchers as well is really trying to understand what does real world use look like for these medications? How do patient reported outcomes change? How does quality of life change in the real world as well? And then understanding if there might be additional different applications for these therapies in some refractory skin diseases that really don't have any good therapy, but may, or sh- may share some therapeutic overlap. So it's really an exciting time clinically to be in medical dermatology, just because for a long time, it was the same medications over and over. But if you probably turn this into a graph, it'd be this exponential peak now that we started seeing all these psoriasis biologic therapies. And then we started seeing now these atopic dermatitis therapies, we're starting to see therapications with oligo for alopecia, hydratinitis again, and, and it, this is really going to be so on and so on. So it's an awesome time to be in dermatology. It's so cool to see all these uh, targeted therapies, like you mentioned earlier, gone are the days that we just try to blast everything, whether we're talking (laughs) chemotherapy or melanoma and all these drugs we're learning and we're we have smart PhDs and, and MDs like you who are really studying these conditions and, and finding these targeted therapies that can focus on turning off the switch or sh- tampering down what we want and not ruining the rest of the immune system or, or someone's whole, uh, you know, blood cell count. So I, I really think it's, it is a cool time to be in medicine. And I can only imagine what it's going to look like in the next 10, 20 years. So it's really exciting how much things have changed. Yeah, it's hard to keep track of many of these new medication approvals, even for people that see a lot of these patients. And I, it's, 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 there's never been a time I can think of where research has been translated into therapy this quickly. And, and you raised a really nice point with many of the checkpoint inhibitors and other modulating medications we have for melanoma and skin cancers. Who would have thought there would be a medical option for some of these things where it just seemed like really bad and brutal surgery that didn't have great outcomes was really sort of all you could do. So immunology and dermatology really go together like peanut butter and jelly, you can say in one sense. And I think that a lot of our therapies are really going to be figuring out how to tamper with and harness some of the activities of the immune system to really help reverse some of these diseases. It's super exciting. And uh, I don't know how you keep straight all these names of all these, (laughs) (laughs) these medications. It's a mouthful, for sure. And you know, with dermatology, a lot of our skin conditions are chronic. And it's not necessarily going to kill you in six months, but it can be really devastating for patients to live with these conditions. People don't want to come near you. They, you know, you get these chronic skin infections. I know living with hydratinitis or atopic derm, I mean, it can really affect someone's life. And to be able to finally have some therapies that can provide relief for these patients is really exciting and amazing. So uh, that's wonderful. Can you use these drugs in all ages, even babies, children? Another good question too. Yeah, yeah, so great question. So, you know, typically with the drug approval process, usually these studies are done in adults or potentially older adolescents and adults before moving downwards. And a lot of this just has to do with what the agency wants to see, how you design a trial and execute it, how you recruit patients. And so of the JAK inhibitors we have right now, there is pediatric and adult indications for most of them stemming from about age 12 and up. And pretty much all of them are being studied in the under 12 population with ongoing trials as well. So I would suspect that you're probably going to see 
uh, age approvals going down, down, down over time to, to definitely younger children. But for now, for, for most of these options, you have the ability to treat 12 and up. Yeah, that's great. Where do you see JAK inhibitors and in, in this research going in the future? I think that probably what we're, what we're going to see is finding the right patient for the right treatment the right disease. Because a lot of these medications kind of work for different conditions to different degrees or for different patient types, different degrees. But we have very little actual real evidence of how you actually can match the right patient to the right treatment. So in the case of atopic dermatitis, I have a topical JAK inhibitor like ruxolitinib and two orals, abracitinib and upadacitinib. And it's not exactly clear sometimes when is the right time to use each one. Yeah, that would be great if we could really pinpoint, okay, this is the perfect candidate for this medication and and this one for that because yeah, it's there's still an art and um even though the medication may work great for one person, uh, it may not for another and and we still haven't quite figured out why and and what those differences are. Well, any pearls you want to tell us about jack inhibitors that you can let our listeners know about that you haven't shared? Hopefully, if I haven't gotten it across uh, to everyone out there, this is something that really excites me in, in dermatology because we have options for patients that typically did not have the ability to get good, efficacious, and safe treatment. And I think it's really going to take all of us just to really work hard to incorporate these therapies as part of our normal armamentarium. Sometimes it can be really easy and comfortable to stick with a lot of the things that we we, we know and we've done, but you're not going to be able to practice dermatology in another few years without using a JAK inhibitor for some disease state. So really understanding that data, balancing it with an understanding of safety, understanding the why behind the mechanism are all going to be big reasons why we're hopefully going to be getting everybody on board when it comes to treatment with this class of medications. Definitely. You got to get old dermatologists like me on board. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this has been great. And I really appreciate uh, all you're doing, all the research you're doing and how you're uh, really taking care of these complex patients and uh, doing great work. So thanks so much for being here. Can you let our listeners know if they want to find out more information or follow you on social media where they can do that? Sure. So um, you want to learn more. There's uh, a lot of work that sort of I'm doing with my group, both in kind of the digital space and sort of the more additional traditional scientific space. Twitter is one place you can find me at Raj MD PhD. Um, and very similarly, you can find me there on, on LinkedIn as well, which is where I sort of share a lot of my stuff. Um, and uh, it's fun. Social media has turned out to be a great place to actually educate people who would have thought on really cool high level medical concepts. Absolutely. I think they say like Gen Zers, they get their medical (laughs) information from social media. So at least we have doctors out there putting real factual information out there. So that that is great. I will definitely link those in the show notes uh, below. And I really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. My real pleasure. Take care.